this section, we're going to be looking at some more of the, the evidences for there being a creator. Um, it was brought to my attention uh, when one of the things that can be daunting about stuff like this is you're learning all these different arguments, and if you think in, to yourself, I have to keep all of these in my head in order to make a difference, then you almost want to just give up before you start. Uh, and so let me assure you that's not necessarily the goal at all. If you're the kind of person that can keep all of these arguments in your head, good for you. Um, you are a better person than I am, uh, and I like this stuff. But the idea is, is once you've kind of washed, let this stuff wash over you, if you've been through this material, what it does is it prepares you to know, what are you saying? There is an answer for that. And you may have to go look it up, which is one of the reasons that we wanted everybody to have a copy of the book, is this is one of those books. There are many books that I have that I read once and then I'm done with. This is one of those books that I have that I think is a really great reference book for evidences. So if you hear some of these arguments or you're dealing with somebody and these things come up, don't feel that you have to have it all in your head. It's perfectly appropriate to go... Um, there's an answer for that, and I don't have it off the top of my head, but can I get back to you? In fact, most people will respect that as being intellectually honest, right? You're not pretending you know something you don't, pretending to be an expert when you're not. You're just simply saying, I know there's an answer, but I need to go look it up. It shows humility, and most honest people will engage that. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. We're not trying to do everything in one shot with people. We're just doing a little bit of gardening wherever we can, planting seeds, doing a little watering at any opportunity. So don't feel like you got to keep all this in your mind. Uh, but what you will probably find is after you've been through something like this is that as arguments like this, you hear them brought up um, sometimes even just brought up as you're watching television or something like that, it will trigger in your mind, wait a second, I know what, what that is. I know that argument. And you may have to refresh on how to handle it, but it, it triggers in your brain. There, there's a logic flaw in what they just said. Um, so tonight uh, is really the last night before we begin to pivot into uh, talking about more moral arguments, and then from there directly into specifics of Bible evidences. So at this point, we've really not been talking about the Bible and evidence for Bible, but primarily evidences for God's existence. So as we talk tonight, I want to bring up some various arguments that you do run across and are used. Uh, and every single one of these that we'll cover tonight are ones that are in standard biology textbooks. Okay, so I have a standard high school biology textbook that is used in you know, three quarters of the high schools in the U.S., some version of this, some edition. They're always updating the editions and changing it. And this is the sort of stuff that shows up in those textbooks when your kids are in those classes, and they bring up evolution and, and the Darwinian idea that we just simply evolved from goo to you, to use the, the language that uh, the chapter heading used. So what fundamentally we're trying to do is what Psalm 139 verse 14 says. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're not here by accident. We're here by design. And if there's nothing else you get out of a class like this, that's all I want you to really walk away with, is there's two options. We're either accidental or we're designed. You can get into the details of how that accident might have happened if you want to look at the Darwinian evolution path. And in fact, that's another misnomer. The idea that there's one agreed-upon theory for evolution is not even accurate. Amongst evolutionists, there's a bunch of different options. There's the Darwinists, there's the Neo-Darwinists, there's punctuated uh, um, evolution, uh, there's uniformitarianism, there's just a zillion different pathways 
that are used to talk about the subject. So they don't even agree with each other. You don't need to know all of those. You don't need to know all of the different potential evolutionary options. You just need to know one thing. They're saying it was an accident. A really cool accident. We're really happy it happened because we're here, but it's an accident. You and I are saying you're designed. And those two things cannot both be true because there is no design in an accident and there's no accident in a design. Does that make sense? So, if, if we boil it down, that's really what we're dealing with. Luke chapter 12 is a set of verses that we use oftentimes to talk about the, the fact that we don't need to be anxious. So, Luke 12, um, Jesus tells us, look at the ravens. You know, you look at the birds of the sky and look at how God takes care of them, even though they don't have any barn to put stuff. Look at the flowers and look at how beautiful they are. And they don't get up in the morning and work to array themselves. And yet, we've all seen flowers that are more beautiful than the latest fashion coming out of Paris. We use that to talk oftentimes about the fact that we need not be anxious. And that is the direct context. So don't misunderstand me. You sh those are, that's a good way to use those verses. But also in Luke 12, he is saying, you can look at the physical world and does it look like something that has a designer that takes care of it or does it look like something that's accidental? When you consider the birds of the air and how they don't have barns or storehouses, does that seem like, wow, what a really impressive accident or does the system and the ecosystems and how all of those work, does that seem designed? Right? So we would look at that and we would consider the ravens. We would consider the lilies and say, wow, look at how God has designed that and they're all taken care of. And a God who designed that and takes care of them, I don't need to be anxious because what is he going to do for me? He'll take care of me, right? So... This is really, what we're doing is no different than that. We're saying, look at the design and see what it teaches us. Uh, and, uh, and the world does not look accidental. It looks designed at every level. Uh, some of the arguments that are used for evolution, and, and that's really what we're doing today, is just kind of looking at miscellaneous, sundry, evolutionary ideas that get thrown at you, especially at the high school and college level. Uh, is homologous uh, organisms, meaning homologous means that they are the same or similar. It's, you think that homo means same. You, probably the place you've heard it the most is homosexuality. Um, and so in the world of evolution, what they say is if you look at, if you look at uh, a flipper, and then you look at like a bird's wing, and then you look at some of the bones uh, in uh, an arm, there's a lot of similarity in how all of those muscle or bone structures work. So what they're gonna say is, as you look at, all, as you look at a lizard, a bird, uh, a dolphin, or a whale, and you look at all these different creatures, and they have similar bone structures, which is, is true, by the way. We're not arguing whether or not there's similarity. There is. That means that they all have a common ancestor that they came from. So that's going to be the argument. Is that since they all have a lot of things in common, as you look under the skin and, and, and the way that the bones and the ligaments and things work, that they must all have a common ancestor, and that's proof of evolution. Does that, make, that, that, that argument that is used, does that make sense? It, okay. What would be one potential flaw with that argument, though? Their argument is, since they all look the same, they must have a common ancestor. That is one view. What's another option? Same creator. Right? The other option for it is that they could instead have a common designer. Um, this other picture, and I understand some of these pictures are small. Um, those are embryos. They're not exciting when you see them large. Um, when you look at a variety of different animals, 
their embryos at certain stages look similar. This is an argument that's used in textbooks all the time. It goes back to a guy by the name of Haeckel, who he did some wood carvings and, and stamping and imprints of different embryos of different species and how they all look the same in the womb. And therefore, since they all look the same in the womb, what that means is that they all really are evolving the same. They, they all started at the same spot. And now they're all evolving from the same general look at the fetus level. And then as they grew and grew and grew, they, uh, uh, they turn into different things. But they all start out in the same spot. So that's something that will be used as proof of, e of evolution. A couple of major problems with this one. That whole embryo argument, one, was before they know what they know now about DNA. Have you ever seen two things that look very similar on the outside but are, in fact, very different? Absolutely, right? Just because two things look similar at a certain stage does not mean that they have any sort of relation to each other at all. Um, the other thing is, the guy who came up with the idea, Haeckel, and this drives me nuts because his, he's still brought up in biology textbooks. Some of the newer ones are starting to get, get rid of him, but he was proven to be a fraud. The scientific community found that Haeckel's embryo thing was entirely a fraud because he didn't grab all these embryos at the same stage. He just, he, he would wait until they kind of look similar. And so maybe one is at one week along and another's at five weeks along and another's at two weeks along and another's at 20 weeks along. And they go, great, they look the same at this point. So see, they're the same. Well, that's called cooking the books, right? That's, that's not good science. And so he's been proven to be a total fraud with that. Uh, the argument that I like to use is the eye of the octopus or the eye of cephalopods, if you want to be really specific about it. So an octopus has a really impressive eye. It's what's called a camera eye, meaning that the way that its eye works is very similar to how a camera does, where it can focus and adjust and, and uh, uh, adjust for distance. It can also adjust for light large amounts of light, the iris will, it'll dilate, uh, low light, it'll dilate the other way. And you should be very familiar with what a camera eye is because guess what you have? You've got a camera eye. So the logic should be then that since human beings have a camera type eye, which not all creatures have camera type eyes, right? Some of them have a very different structure. You take a fly, very different structure to their eye. They still can see, but they don't see the way you do. You take a human eye, and it's camera type eye. You take a octopus eye, and it's camera type eye. So according to the homologous argument, what should we have? We should have a common ancestor, right? Except if you ask any evolutionary biologist, do we have a common ancestor with octopus, they're going to say no. They're going to say no. That's an analogous case because they know and have lots of evidence that there's no way that human beings come from the same evolutionary path, even according to their theories. So here's the problem. When things look the same, they'll say it's a common ancestor unless it doesn't fit their model. You see the problem with that? You're not being consistent. And so that's one of the major issues they run into. And, and so I like to just ask them, I say, oh, okay, so whenever anything looks the same and it has a similar structure, they have a common ancestor. And they'll say, yes. And I'll say, so we have a common ancestor with an octopus. And if you're talking to somebody who is, uh, really knows their stuff, which typically if you're hearing this sort of language, you're talking to somebody who's kind of deep in it, um, that'll, that'll throw them. Because what you've done is brought up that they only use that argument when it works for them, but they don't use it when it doesn't work for them. And that's being tricky. And we've all done that when we were wrong in an argument with somebody, <laughs> but we wanted to win anyways, right? We, we, we use one standard for them, but another standard when, it, when it's for us. And so that's what goes on with that. Um, 
a good way to describe the homologous issue and just to deal with it in a common sense sort of way is if you're driving down the road and you come into a neighborhood, ever done this? Drive into a, a subdivision and all the houses look really similar. Very similar architecture style. Maybe they're painted similar. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the window style is all the same. There's, they are all homologous to each other. All of those houses in that division look similar. So, as you're driving through the division, what you do is you go and look for the ancestor house that they all evolved from, right? Well, that's not what you do. What do you do? When you see that, what does your brain automatically do when you drive through a division and almost all the houses look the same? What do you think? Same builder. It was, oh, it was just one builder who did all these houses. This is from the same subdivision, and they came through at a certain time, and they used certain blueprints. And, and so the idea that homologous structures require a common ancestor, they do require something in common. I would agree with that point. There, there is something in common. It is impressive that there's these similar structures in lots of different creatures on the planet. But the commonality doesn't have to be a common ancestor. It could be a common designer. That makes sense? Anybody have any questions? So that type of argument I like to use all the time. I think the one that they use in the book is if you uh, look at a pot and then you look at a smaller pot and a smaller pot and a smaller pot and then somebody has in their kitchen all the way down to the teaspoon, nobody says, oh, the, 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 the lobster pot evolved from the teaspoon. That's, that's the argument that they like to use. They just go, no, no, they all came from the same manufacturer, right? And that's why they have similarity. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised. We have one God, and he's unified in his thinking. Have you ever built two things and used some of the same ideas when you were building? Right? We do it all the time. Artists, we, we look at an artist, and how do they know that certain artists... The artist may be even long gone and dead, and they say, we think this is a Picasso. How do they know? There's a certain style, right? There's a Picasso way of doing things that stands out as his style, and that is his fingerprint as a creator. That's really all that this is, too. When we look at the world and the fact that God has used some similar building blocks and he's used some similar structures and things, that just... That's just God's creative touch, and it's wonderful. Yes, yep. Absolutely, do it. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense that if you have this good design and it works, it will work. Yeah, it's an elegant design. Why not use it more than once? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, and, and I mean, it's the same reason when you look at fish. Why do all fish basically have the same gill system? It's, a, it's an elegant solution, right? It's an elegant solution for breathing underwater. It, and so, yes, that's a great way to think of it in terms of engineering. It's problem solving and it works. It was an elegant solution. Stick with it. Yeah. Okay. So one other thing that you can bring up along with this, and we touched on it a little bit last week, is the term of irreducible complexity. All that means is some things are as simple as you can make them, but you can't make them any more simple. And a mousetrap is a great example of that. So you take a mousetrap, and it's a beautiful design. Back to that engineering idea. It's, it's really a, a pretty elegant engineering solution. You have a platform, right? You have the, the, the hammer bar of some sort that's on a spring. You have a catch bar holding it back, and you have a release lever. What part could you take away and make that simpler and still have a mousetrap? You could take away the cheese. Yes, you could take away the cheese. You're right. Yes, you could take away the cheese, and you'd still have a mousetrap. 
But aside from that, nothing, right? Uh, if somebody wants to be really clever, they'll say, well, you could take away the platform and then you could just put it and, and attach it to the ground. Well, that may sound clever, but what did the ground just become? It became your platform. So it's, it really does, it's just another way of creating a platform. So that's why the old saying is, if you could build a better mousetrap, they beat a pathway to your door. Actually, that full saying is, if you could build a better mousetrap or preach a better sermon, they beat a path to your door. Um, yeah, true story, that's the full saying. Um, but mousetraps are simple and elegant and very well made. And you can't make them any simpler. If you could, people would. But that's about as simple as you could get it and have the mechanism be a mousetrap. So here's the thing. Mousetraps are like a lot of other things in life where if you start removing parts, it doesn't work right. Now, not everything's that way. If you've ever done a car repair job and ended up with a few extra bolts at the end, that was reducibly complex. <laughs> I don't know how long it'll last, <laughs> but, you know, you can get away with it in some things. But take the human eye. It has a lot going on, and I will tell you I am not an expert in this stuff. But, you know, it doesn't take much for you to realize, man, if we start messing with stuff much at all, you don't have an eye. Which is also why when you think about having eye surgery, there's lots of people who feel very comfortable having surgery, but then I say, well, what about having eye surgery? Yeah. It's very delicate. It's a very delicate mechanism. You take away the nerves that go to the brain, it doesn't work. You take away the brain's ability to decode the, the message that the nerves are sending and it's no good. You take away the ability to dilate, doesn't work. You take away the cornea, doesn't work. I mean, all of these things are very, very delicate. There has to be a certain amount of blood flow to it and not uh, anymore. Um, two of my daughters, both Eve and Cozy, were both premature. It's a problem they run into with prematurity. So when children are born premature, they have to put them on oxygen to keep them alive. Makes sense? So we put them on oxygen, but then guess what? You put too much oxygen into a growing baby and the blood vessels start to grow wrong. They, do, they have to actually grow in a certain shape and direction. And if they don't, they detach things and your child is blind. A lot of children that were born premature 20, 30 years ago ended up blind because they had to choose, do we give them oxygen or not? If we don't give them oxygen, they die. But if we give them oxygen, they go blind. And so they give them the oxygen, but the child ends up being blind. Very delicate mechanism, right? So you need the right percentage of oxygen at just the right dosage, right, as they're growing in order for that to all work. That's just one part of you. And so if you start pulling bits of that out, you don't have an eye. Well, the whole idea of evolution is survival of the fittest. Which is more fit? Somebody with part of an eye or a creature with part of an eye. So they got the socket and there's junk dangling out. I, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but you know, they got, they got some of this stuff and it's taking energy and whatnot. Or the creature that doesn't have it at all. The, the creature with part of an eye is less fit. In the, in the, in the process of uh, evolution, at every stage, you have to be better than you were at the last. And so the analogy I like to use with it, that I go along with the mousetrap, is I like to use a bicycle example. So imagine you had a bicycle and you're gonna ride the bicycle to work. Okay, so every day you have to ride it to work. If you can't ride the bicycle to work, you don't get paid and you starve and you die. So you have to be able to ride it to work every single day. No bike, no transportation, you die. Survival of the fittest. But every day, you have to replace one part on your bike until you have a motorcycle. But every day, you got to drive it to work, and it has to be a little bit faster than it was the day before. Because if somebody else gets there on their bike before you, you don't get to work, you die. 
what are the chances you could do it? And you're not doing it by accident, are you? That's what evolution is, it's accidental. You're doing it on purpose with design, trying to find the right part. But at some point, you don't go to work, you die. That's the problem with irreducible complexity. If you move from one complex thing, and then you try and move to another, even more complex thing, if at any point in that process, you are less fit for survival, you die, and dead things don't evolve. Uh, so uh, a good, uh, another example are giraffes. Uh, so you go to the zoo, you look at the giraffes. Giraffes are cool, right? So giraffes have a massive heart, like this big. Is that about right? I'm looking at the, the pros over here. It, I, I will tell you, I feel much more uh, aware of my knowledge when I know that there are people who can, can check me on it. Um, but huge heart. Now, they have a huge heart, and the reason they have that huge heart is because it has to pump all the way up to their brain. Because if you don't get blood as your brain, guess what you do? You die, okay? So, that heart has to be there, but it has to be there at the exact same time as the long neck. Because if they have a short neck and the big heart, guess what the blood does? Pops their head off. That is not technical. But it, they, de they do definitely die, right? Too much blood pressure, go straight to the brain, boom, you're dead. Those things both have to be there at the same time. If you've ever heard the evolutionary argument of you know, giraffes slowly over time evolve this longer neck, forget about it. That doesn't work. They would have to get all the pieces at the exact same time. Another problem with giraffes, so if, 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 raise your hand if you've ever seen like a National Geographic thing where giraffes take a drink. You know, they go down to the lake and, okay, yeah, so they kind of spread their legs out and they dip their head down. Well, when they dipped their head down, they went from gravity going against the flow of blood to now gravity going with the flow of blood. You with me? So now the blood is flowing down to their head instead of up. So what happens when their heart pumps? Brains blow out again. Except it doesn't, right? They drink all the time. Well, the reason for that is, is in their neck, there's all these little shunts. These, think of them like little valves that will adjust and shut in order to keep the flow proper. So you need those different valves there, or they can't take a drink, or they die, and you need the heart there, and you need the lung, you need all those pieces all at once. Every bit of it has to happen. And if it doesn't, they're dead, and dead things don't evolve. That's the idea of irreducible complexity. It's not as simple as, oh, we'll just change one little thing, and then another little thing, and then another little thing, and it all worked that way. It has to happen in, in a way that would require lots of things to happen all at the exact same time in order for it to work. Uh, anybody have any comments or questions or anything that they'd like to add to that? Yeah. Bombardier beetle. Yes. Yep. 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 Yeah. There and and it's true. There's lots of creatures like this. I mean, I'm I'm giving a couple of examples, but there's a ton of them. The monarch butterfly is fascinating that way, and they multi generational migration patterns. It's like, how do you know to go from this place to that place? Yeah, all of that. So it's not a problem that just shows up once in a while. That's and I. I think that's important for us to understand. This is a problem you're going to run into over and over and over again. Is how what's the mechanism for that evolving? Because you need all of those pieces there at once. Um, okay, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 12 says, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. In Genesis uh, chapter 1, it talks about vegetation being after their kind, meaning you plant, you plant watermelon seed and, and you get watermelons, right? You, you plant uh, an acorn, you get an oak, all those sorts of things. Um, 
it also talks about animals being that way. And then again, when you get to Noah and, and the creatures going on the ark, it refers to this language of kind. You should bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They should be male and female. Um, I, 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 I at times have mixed feelings about the organization answers in Genesis because I don't always agree with everything they do. But this is one thing that I think that they've done a pretty good job of. Um, that's that group that is based here in uh, Kentucky. Um, that... The Bible has no problem with the idea of there being different creatures and there being kinds of creatures and that within a kind, you can have variation. So when Noah put all the animals on the ark, he puts them according to kind. Um, I don't think he had to put every single horse type on the ark. Or every single dog, the St. Bernard, the Chihuahua, everything in between. You could just put a dog kind on the ark of which all of that variation is there. The Bible has no problem with that idea. The problem that the Bible has is when you take variation within kind, meaning you can have all different kinds of horses, you have all different kinds of cats. Right? You go to the zoo, all sorts of different cats. And you have tigers and, and lions, and yet, has anybody ever heard of a liger? Yeah, that's a real thing. Google it. Ligers and the opposite, tigon. It's a real thing. They can interbreed. Um, they, they are all of the same kind. But there's a lot of variety within that. I mean, you go to the zoo and you see the, the majestic lion, and then you see a jaguar, and then you, you see... Um, a leopard, a lot of variety there. A lot of information within DNA for variety. We have no problem with variety within kind and movement within kind. What we have a problem with is saying that a tiger could slowly but surely evolve into a baboon. Right? That, that's where our problem comes in. Um, and... What happens is there's this logic flaw that is being taught to kids left and right that what I'm going to call microevolution is the same thing as macroevolution. Microevolution, and, and this is a phrase we sometimes get very nervous about as Christians, the saying there's any form of evolution. But we see it, and we've, in fact, we've even hijacked it in the case of dogs, right? When we wanted dogs that could chase alongside of chariots, we bred them, and we called them Dalmatians. When you wanted a, a friendly lap dog that could sit on your lap, and then you looked over at the household St. Bernard and said, well, that's not going to work. What did we do as human beings when we wanted lap dogs? We bred them smaller. We kept making them smaller and smaller and, until people said, oh, that's so cute. I'll give you $7,000 for it. Uh, that's what we did. We hijacked that there's all this information within the dog kind that you can move that way. We have no problem with that. So if you go back to Darwin, Darwin made this famous trip uh, to the Galapagos Islands. And what he observed on the Galapagos Islands were finches. And he saw that there were different finches, and he particularly paid attention to beak size. And he said there, there were ones with short beaks, and there were ones with long beaks. And depending upon the climate uh, or the food availability on the island, short-beaked ones uh, were either prevalent or long-beaked ones based off of the environment that they were living in. So he came to the conclusion, he said, well, look, if you, if you track it over the course of generations, and they've done this, by the way, especially in the Galapagos, they've, they've tracked finches in the Galapagos uh, better than almost anything. Um, there is absolutely an adjustment amongst finches to the, the food sources that are there. They either get the, the survival of the fittest, the longer beaked ones uh, end up doing well, and so you will go through a period of time where there's longer beaked ones. Or uh, on one of the islands, maybe it's the, the sturdiness of the shorter beak that can break uh, nuts and things like that. That's more fit, and so they'll have the short-beaked ones. So he said, oh, well, look, they're evolving. But the problem is, is he, he did all of this studying, and others after him have done tons of studying of finches, and they've studied all of the different diversity and, 
and movement of evolution of finches. But guess what they've always seen? Finches. They're always finches. Nobody's gone back one year and said, oh, puppies showed up. This doesn't do, that, that, that doesn't happen, right? And in fact, what they, and they don't tell you this, as they documented it, they see that it, it doesn't continue to go one direction. Because when we think of evolution, that's what we think of. It's going one direction, right? You're going towards a better, more fit kind that's somewhere out in the distance that's never been found. They found instead oscillation. So it, it'll go towards long beaks, and then it'll go back towards short beaks, and then it'll go back towards long beaks. So is there change from generation to generation? Absolutely. But it's within kind. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on that? Or anything anybody wants to add to that, that concept? Yes. Mm hmm Yeah, absolutely. So you've got a ton of genetic diversity there. You've got a lot of opportunity. And as we've, we talked about last week, DNA holds a ridiculous amount of information anyways. I mean, so yes, absolutely. We're not just, in, in a lot of those cases, you have seven pairs. And so, yeah, just tons of it. Um, okay, uh, this next one, uh, this one is two sides of a canyon, and they have two types of squirrels. The, the the Kaibab squirrel and the Abert squirrel. And they'll use, this is from a textbook. And they'll say, see, here's this canyon. And there's a river in between. And on this side, you have the Kaibab squirrel. And over this, you have the Abert squirrel. squirrel and they are different. And you can, and physically, you can see them. They look different, right? So, look at how evolution works. Except, what are we still dealing with? Two squirrels. We're still dealing with squirrels. So microevolution does not prove macroevolution. Change within kind does not choose, uh, prove change with, outside of kind. This is actually, uh, that one is chapter 16, Evolution of Populations from uh, the biology textbook that I was telling you about. On the cover, Evolution of Populations, they have horses. Kentucky. Are there different kinds of horses? Mike, we want to put one of your draft horses in the derby next year? <laughs> You're not going to do too well, right? But if they want to pull something, that's what you want. They're bred for different things. There's definite diversity and, and a large amount of it within horse kind. And we see it and we, we even leverage it, right? We leverage those different... Uh, uh, traits that show up in the DNA and are recessive, and then so we kind of we, we tease it out of generations to get the fastest horse possible. People pay big money for Derby winter horses and for that breeding. We do that, but we still are left with horses. Can you imagine somebody paying you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to breed with a Derby winner? How upset would they be if that horse gave birth to a lizard? This was not what I paid for, right? And I understand I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the extremes with this. No evolutionist thinks that, that that's how quick it happens. But our point is, you never see it happen at all. You see no hint of it. Um, yeah, anybody have any comments or questions or anything like that? Okay, so the last one, and we've already really talked about it, is dogs and they will use dogs as proof of evolution, and that one just blows my mind. And the reason for it is, is all the diversity that you have in dogs, who made that happen? Did that happen on accident? Yeah, Theron raised his hand. We did it. We did it. So even if you want to look at that, one, you still have dogs. We haven't jumped kind to something else, but to all of that diversity, 
has been teased out by designers. They just happen to be us. So it's just a really bad example. But it's, a, it's thrown in as a gimme by biology teachers all the time. All the time. It is one of the, the most common entry-level examples given to children of how evolution is true. And so just uh, being aware that that's out there and that that doesn't prove their point at all um, is, I think, important for us to understand. Um, okay. Then the next one is Genesis chapter 7, um, verse 11 through 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. This one I'm going to go through fairly quickly. But um, your Bible talks about catastrophic changes to the earth. Uh, what I have up there is a a geologic time scale chart. And you've, you'll see these in biology textbooks all the time and geology classes where you have this chart of all these different layers. And as you go through all the different layers, you, you see all the different fossils. And at the top are the fossils of the more complicated creatures all the way down to the least complicated creatures. And all of that that happens in that geologic time scale. So as you dig down, you're digging back in time. That's the way they'll describe that. So a couple of problems with that. One, this doesn't exist anywhere in the world. There's nowhere in the world you could go. And I was not aware of that. I guess it made me really mad the first time I realized it. Because I've been taught this for years. That this, you know, you got all these layers. And so I always envisioned there was this spot where geologists are digging layer by layer down further and further and seeing all of these things. This doesn't exist anywhere but in textbooks. There's nowhere where all of these layers are put together. What they do is they build this time scale by taking little pockets over here and little pockets over there and little pockets over there and then they go, you put them all together into this one geologic time scale. There's no place on earth where that actually exists at all. That's the first thing. The, the second thing is, um, is, and this is also from a textbook, uh, and I put it up so you can see this is not me saying it, this is what they, they teach. Uh, after more than three billion years of evolution from single cells to multicellular life, an explosion of life happened in Earth's shallow seas. In less than 30 million years, a, more, uh, a mere instant in Earth's vast history, uh, nearly all the major animal groups living today first appeared. This is what is referred to as the Cambrian explosion. Um, and is a major problem for evolutionists. Evolutionists, all, the whole idea is slow change over time. Time is the wind. It slowly happened. Mm, the, the vast majority of everything that they find is found in what they call the Cambrian layer. So you went from basically no fossils to almost every fossil you could ever find. Does that sound like evolution, which is slow change over time, or does that sound like a catastrophic event where the Earth was, had some things happen to it all at once? Right? And a bunch of things died really quickly. The, what I think you will find is that so many of the things that they attribute to evolution fit much better to a catastrophic world model. Meaning, when the, the Noatian flood happened, and the rains come down and the floods, uh, fountains of the deep break open. A lot of stuff died and got buried very quickly and fossilized. And so that is a much better model than this evolutionary over time. So when you hear some of this stuff about geology, that idea, first of all, that geologic timescale does not actually exist in the real world. And then two, it matches a better uh, with a catastrophic model. Okay, with that, does anybody have any comments or questions or anything that they'd like to add before we, we shut down? Okay, Steve.